Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Engaging the Phenomenon. And today we are honored to have a returning guest, Peter Lavenda. Welcome, Peter. Thanks for having me. Nice to see yeah. you. And and for people watching, listen, you know, Peter Lavenda has has written a um, book, series of books, uh, Unholy Alliance is the Nazi and the Occult, uh, Sinister Forces, um, but also people are going to be very familiar in, in the UFO seen with uh secret machines so uh, you know i highly recommend you, you check all those out it's uh, you know it's, you're going to go down a journey it's super com comprehensive and in all all these volumes uh, you know peter does immaculate sourcing so if you want to go down a, a rabbit hole uh for a few months pick up pick up one of his books and you're going to get lost and again it's so well sourced that it's 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 pretty incredible um but for the listeners here today, I, I know you've probably done this uh, a million times, Peter, but I think it is important when introducing you that um, you give a, a short outline of um, secret machines, gods, man, and war, just very briefly, sure. uh, so people understand the context of that. So um, God, gods, man, and war, what, what is a general, the theme of that? Yeah, it's a trilogy, as the name implies. So volume one is gods. Uh, volume two is man, and the third volume, which is coming out eventually, is called War. So it's God's man and war. And the idea is we're approaching the phenomenon, what we're calling, we always call the phenomenon rather than just UFO or UAP. We know it's a bit more complicated than that. So what we're doing is, number one, we are based on the assumption that the phenomenon is real. We're not out to prove to anybody that there have been UFO sightings or there have been you know, close encounters of that stuff. We're, we're, we start from that basis point. Yes, it's happened, it exists, it's real. Now what? So in God's, what we do is we approach it from the earliest recorded um, instances of sightings. The phenomenon seems to be recorded within the context of religion. So we, in God's, we go through all sorts of uh, permutations. We look at different kinds of religions and uh, what they said about beings from the sky or lights in the sky or travel to the stars and travel back and forth. So we look at it from that point of view and we're saying, okay, what does all this mean? What, what could it tell us, these ancient texts, about what we're all experiencing today, what we're writing about today, what the government is looking at today? That was kind of in general what God's was about. And it was laying the groundwork for volume two, which is man. And man is about um, dissecting our understanding of science, uh, science as you know, biology, genetics, consciousness, um, all different permutations of all of that. What does all of that mean? Uh, and how does that relate to the phenomenon? What can the phenomenon tell us about that? Why is the phenomenon um, a challenge or even a critique of what we think about when we think about science. Just as when we think about religion in book one, we're now thinking about science in book two, are they that different? Is the phenomenon only science or is it only religion or is there some third concept that's above and beyond both science and religion? Uh, so we have the point of view and it's one that got us a lot of doors opened in the beginning with the To The Stars project was that both religion and science in general, human society in general, is a cargo cult. And that's based upon this religion that started uh, in the last century in the South Pacific with basically Stone Age tribes seeing for the first time airplanes landing and disgorging products, goods. Um, it could be medicine, it could be weapons, it could be uh, armored vehicles it was during wartime. And these, these people see this for the first time. They haven't even seen, they have not no knowledge of electricity, of communications, uh, of, of you know, digital communications didn't exist, but no telephones, no televisions, no radios, nothing, they, nothing. And suddenly they're looking at an airplane. There's no context for that experience. And so what they did is they started to build their own landing strips. And they started to duplicate what they saw of these planes landing in the hopes that one of these planes would land on their landing strip and give them all kinds of stuff. Our, our point of view in, in the Secret Machines project for, for the nonfiction books was we are still part of that cargo cult. We are all a cargo cult. 
our science is dedicated towards traveling to the stars and immortality. These are the ancient religious concepts as well as the scientific ones. The ancient peoples wanted to travel to the stars and live forever. So in a religious context, in a scientific context, it's the same thing. We're a cargo cult. We're still a cargo cult. And that kind of colors everything that we do uh, where science and religion is concerned. And that leads us inexorably to volume three, which is war. And war is conflict. So now we have this religious, religious understanding, a scientific understanding. And with human beings, that's going to lead inevitably to conflict. Somebody has more weapons. Somebody has more knowledge. Somebody has a different religion. What, what does the conflict between people, especially in the last hundred years, what does that tell us about the phenomenon? How did different governments approach the phenomenon? Was it a secret weapons uh, platform? Was it an intelligence operation by an unfriendly government? Uh, so on and so forth. And we go deep into this. We go into the Russian um, stories of UFOlogy. We go into the Chinese stories. We go around the world and we start unwrapping all of this and looking at how our government in the United States reacted in the 1950s to that infamous UFO overflight over Washington, DC in 1952, and their reaction to it, their official reaction in their, in their press conference in July of 52, in which they tried to frame the UFO phenomenon in weird biblical religious terms. It's the funniest freaking thing. And if you go and you download that, or you'll find it in the book as well, and you read what they said and how they said it, and who is attending that conference, the whole future history of ufology is in that one meeting in 1952. It's all there. Heineck was there. The guy from Roswell was there, you know, the, uh, the intelligence guy. I mean, everybody was there in that room discussing the overflight in Washington, D.C., and trying to frame it in paranormal terms. It's, it's incredible. So God's men in war were trying to get a handle on the UFO phenomenon, all different perspectives. And the goal is to tell people we need everybody's input on this. It can no longer just be a bunch of scientists somewhere or the military or the intelligence community. We need the artists involved. We need the writers. We need the creators. We need people from different countries, different ethnic backgrounds, different races, different religions. Everybody's got a piece of the puzzle. And the whole point of this trilogy is to expose that, to say everybody had a contribution to make and they still have a contribution and we're never going to find out what this really is if we just depend upon the government to tell us. Yeah, and um, you know, I, you know, I want to say I, I think you guys, you know, to the stars have done a great job, uh, despite the controversy. I think you've you guys done have done a great job overall in in putting, you know, assisting and being part of the conversation, getting everything into the public conversation where it is now, and. Um, you know, for, you know, I do have, I know you can't go too far into it, but I do have a few questions for, uh, about war. Um, but I also would like to ask you about, uh, the advisors and was there, was there any specific or, you know, general inputs that the advisors had regarding the secret machines project? Well, we started with the advisors. So when Tom contacted me first, it was the very end, I think, of the year 2014, November, I think, of 2014. And um, that's when he was gung-ho to do all of this. And we got, we got together and started talking about uh, you know, all the possibilities. And he, he had already been in contact uh, with a number of the people that we eventually started to call the advisors, of which there were about 10 uh, in total. And um, Initially, the approach was very different from the UFO community. The UFO community has an adversarial approach to the military and to the government. And I understand that. Um, I grew up the same way. Um, I'm a child of the 60s, like everybody else in that, in that room at the time. So the idea was, you know, government is withholding things. They're lying to you. They know more than they're saying all of these things. And, my, and Tom's approach, and, and I was 100% on board with it was that if we keep taking this adversarial approach, it's not gonna get us anywhere. They're not going to suddenly say, oh yes, you're right, how sorry we are, here's the crown jewels. It's not just not gonna work that way. What you have to do is approach this problem differently. We have to say, you know, from the point of view we know, 
there was a Cold War. The, the Soviet Union was a major threat. Eventually, China became a threat as well. So, you know, I grew up uh, in the 1950s, you know, the air raid siren drills and hiding under the desk with your hands over your neck and everything, you know, kissing your ass goodbye and taking that, that whole thing. That was what we grew up doing. I mean, every Friday there were air raid drills. And we went through this in our classrooms because the Russians at any moment were going to bomb us. So when you're growing up in that environment, did you really think the military was going to say, oh, by the way, you don't have to worry just about the Russians, the Chinese, communists, J. Edgar Hoover, the mafia, and everything else. Guess what? We got aliens. <laughs> we got this too, you know, and let's worry about that as well. That was not going to happen, uh, number one. Number two, the military didn't know what to make, I think, of what was going on with the phenomenon. Um, and in, in the third way, we didn't want the other countries to know we were having this issue. We didn't want the Soviets to know we were having a UFO issue or that there might have been a crash at Roswell or somewhere else in the United States or all of these things. We could not be revealed to our enemies who really wanted us dead, who, who were had submarines off our coastline who had put missiles in Cuba. You know, we're not gonna go and tell the Soviets these, these issues. We're not gonna publicize it in our country and have the Russians either make fun of it, which they did eventually, or um, accuse us of using the UFO phenomenon as a kind of psychological warfare against the Soviet Union. I mean, all of this stuff came out. We talk about it in the third volume in war since you brought it up. So this is gonna be there you know, we're going to discuss some of that because it's important the way governments handled it. So we approached the advisors from that point of view. We know th the problem. We know you couldn't come out and tell us, but what can you tell us now? Soviet Union is history. Um, Russia is still there. There's still kind of a threat, but it's not like it used to be. We're not fighting world communism and all this other stuff anymore. Um, Things have changed militarily. Things have changed from, an, from a geopolitical standpoint. We have different problems now. Has, it, has that attitude changed when it comes to the phenomenon? What can you tell us, <coughs> excuse me, about it? And in some cases, people talk to us kind of openly. When I say us, I mean in general. They talk to Tom mostly. They will talk to Tom about, you know, well, there was this, there was that. We can't talk about it, but you can look here, you can look there. And in other cases, in one particular case, we had one advisor who was giving us these, they were, he was very um, responsive to a lot of the questions Tom would ask, but he would answer almost Socratically. He would answer with another question, or he would answer with, did you think about this? Or why don't you look over here without violating any secrecy or NDAs or you know, clearance problems? He would just say something totally off the wall. So he would tell Tom, for instance, have you thought about Greek mythology? <laughs> and Tom would call me on the phone and say, what the fuck is this guy talking about Greek mythology? I'm asking about UFOs. He's giving me, you know, Greek, he's talking about Prometheus. You know, what is, yeah. what am I supposed to do with that, right? And I will say to him, I will look over this and think, you know, I think he's trying to tell you something. If you look a little deeper at the story of Prometheus, it's really very interesting because Prometheus was there at the beginning of the human race. And Prometheus felt sorry for human beings. It was going to give them the, the, the mystery of fire, right? For which the gods would punish him. I mean, I said, there's a, there's a lot to unpack in the Prometheus story. He's trying to tell you something. Let's look at this a bit more deeply. Or we would ask something else and the, the advisors would come back and, and, and give another question, a non-answer answer. answer. Um, or a non-confirmation confirmation, or would say something that was seemed so strange that I would I would ask Tom, Tom, did you see the movie um, All the President's Men? <laughs> Do you remember when you know Deep Throat was saying stuff and everybody else had to figure out what was going on? I said, that's happening. You know, it's happening now. And the problem is it's very obscure and the subject matter is so obscure. And it resists an easy explanation. I said, we have to know, we have to communicate to our people, to our readers and the people who are following you, that there is no easy explanation to this. There is no one size fits all when it comes to the phenomenon. We can't just come out and say, yes, they're aliens from Arcturus or, you know, uh, some, or Sirius or SAR system or something. It's, there's not going to be 
an easy answer to this. They're here. We know they're here. We know they've been here for thousands of years. So we have to find some way to accommodate this information into our worldview, because until now, we've been excluding that part of the equation. We think it's just us. And we think everything we've done is just us. And for the most part, that is pretty much it. But we've been sharing this space, whether it's the Earth as a planet or whether it's this dimension or whatever it is, we're sharing it with something else that we cannot describe because we don't have the words for it. We don't have the vocabulary. We, we quite frankly don't have the science. And we know we don't have the science because when we see these things and when they're flying outside of our, our destroyers and our battleships and, and of our, our fighter jets and our hornets and all the rest of it, they are exhibiting a science that we don't have. They're demonstrating to us that our science cannot understand their science. And until, until we can understand their science, we can't understand them. We, can have, we have no context for understanding what they are. It's really, really difficult and tricky. And if we try to give a simple answer to the people who read Secret Machines and say that we have solved the problem, this is it, it's going to be wrong, it's going to be misleading, it's going to be unethical. We're going to have to show them how difficult this really is. We're going to have to say, listen, take a breath. It's not what you think it is. It's a lot more tricky, a lot, a lot more difficult. And, you know, was, was there ever, and I, I just want to say too, for, you know, for the listeners, you know, I love how in, in, in gods and men, uh, which are out and available now, um, there's, there's so many things in there that I, I was glad to see that I had, uh, you know, other research angles that I had come across in my own journey and exploration, like Gnosticism, uh, Merkaba, and, uh, you know, possibly, you know, or, you know, very, very much likely non-human intelligence interaction with um, involvement with religion, ancient history, and all those kind of themes that are, and, you know, and man, the, the contact and, and the DNA and all that. I think that those are very, um, good threads that are involved in the entire story so to speak and like you said there's no easy simple answer and the um the quote that you you usually say you know if if all you ever read are, are ufo books you're never going to understand the phenomenon it is uh, you know very very true i believe um but uh, another question about the advisors is was there ever any indication from them that they felt that 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 P, the the public, the people, the you know should should know about the phenomenon or you know that this needs to come out uh, in in any way? And was there an maybe even an urgency behind that, or what was the kind of perspective on that? Yeah, I don't think they would have thought of it. Uh, in, in those terms, that there was an urgency behind it. I think that a lot of the advisors, I can't speak for all of them, I can only speak for what came down through me, through Tom, for the most part, is that um, they do know more, obviously, than we know in terms of sheer amount of data, uh, in, in terms of, of what they have on radar traces and all the rest of it. There's a, there's a lot more information that we don't have, but that doesn't mean that they know what it is. They just have a lot more data. And understanding the data is the critical part. And I think they realize that they need help to understand this data. And they've been shoehorning people in here and there, I think, to help with certain specific aspects of it. But it's like the blind men and the, and the, and the elephant, right? That story that I love to tell because it's so, it, it, it demonstrates this, this problem that we have. We have a lot of people who are blind who are trying to figure out what an elephant is by touching different parts of the elephant. And they don't have the whole, nobody has the whole picture. You know, one blind guy touches the tail and thinks an elephant is like a rope. Another person touches the ear and thinks it's like a, a palm tree, uh, on and on and on. So they have their own perspectives on what the phenomenon is, but it's, it's isolated. You need a complete context, a complete picture, which incorporates not only the science and the technology, but the consciousness aspect of it as well, because that's a major aspect of the phenomenon as it affects us is the consciousness aspect. People seeing these things and being forever changed by it, people having the close encounters, 
or people just seeing it in the air and it changes their, their way of looking at the world forever because they don't have a place to put this in. If you're flying a fighter jet, you know, and you see, you know, a swarm of these Tic Tacs hovering around you doing weird stuff and then disappearing. Okay, you know, what do you do with that? Where do you put it? You know, you're, you're, you're basically a scientist if you're piloting a Hornet. And, you know, you have all this equipment and the data and all the technology. You have heads-up displays. You've got missiles. You've got it all. And you can't handle what this is. You can't handle the thing that you're seeing. So there's no context. So I think with the, the military, the intelligence community, and to a certain extent as well, the, the, the private industry aspect of all of this, all these people together are trying to figure out what this is. I don't know if they feel a sense of urgency. I think that if they felt a sense of urgency, I personally would be terrified because if they feel a sense of urgency, it means they know something's up. They know we're at a, at a, at a tipping point somehow. I'd rather not think that. I'd rather think they're all taking their time because they know they got it under control. But you know, and I know there's, you know, they don't have it under control. You know, they may think they have it under control, that's fine. But there's gonna be aspects of this that they can't, they can't understand. There's got to be, or else they would have come out with it and said, okay, this is it, this is the story. Nobody panic, we got this under control. It's like this, this, and this. They haven't done that, but they're starting to. They're starting to open up. They're starting to reveal it. They're starting to do this. And it's not because they want to. It's because the technology that we have now has so far outstripped what there was back in the 1940s and the 1950s that at any moment, somebody somewhere on the planet is gonna figure this out on their own. They're going to see something, they're going to record something with a cell phone or somehow, or they're going to use AI to figure this out, or they're going to use some other, some other systems operation to figure this out, and they're going to come up with an answer. And that can happen at any moment. And I think that, more than anything else, is making people who do know what this is very nervous, that they're, they, they, they have to get out ahead of this thing. Because if they don't, somebody else will. And it's going to be somebody like you or me or anybody else on the planet. It could be someone in a small vill village in Indonesia that sees something and just happens to be in the right place at the right time with the right technology. And bingo, you know, we've got, we've got, uh, we've got pay dirt here. We've got something that we can show the world. And everyone's going to scramble and trying to, to either explain it or poo-poo it or, or hide it or deep six it or whatever. But the cat will be out of the bag. You just can't fool the rest of us as much as you used to be able to. It's getting out of control. Yeah, and I don't know if it's going to be a theme in 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 war of God's man war, but I know the the mission statement for OSAP um, help put off was talking about at a lecture, I believe in 2018 or 2019, that you know one of the main goals of or one of the main security issues for OSAP was that, you know, we wanted to be able to look at the, the UFO phenomenon uh, and try to understand the technology and, and possibly, you know, project 50 years out if we can develop the technology before foreign adversarial country did. Right. And, you know, that was a major concern. And, you know, with the, the problem that we had with all the stove piping is that we don't know what, how the other countries are handling it. If they have a little bit more, if we have 20 scientists working on it and they have 300, that, you know, that's a, that's a problem for us because that many minds working together on something, they could crack something that we haven't, and that could be leveraged. Um, but I, I, you know, aside from that, I also um, want to get into the idea of uh, seeded, seeded technology. Um, is that something that's discussed in, in war at all? No, not exactly, because I don't have enough documentation on something like that to make a case. And that's, um, that's, that's what I try to do in these books is to make sure whatever I talk about is pretty thoroughly documented. There's the speculation, of course, that there is seeded technology, that we've uncovered some stuff and that it, it, it influenced our technology. The famous case of fiber optics, you know, um, that um, the, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, the day after Roswell, Philip Corso yeah. uh, talked about, he, he started talking about that a great deal, but Corso came under a lot of criticism. You know, was he telling the truth? Was he making it up? Was he you know, trying to make a buck here and there? All these things. 
I know that he was visited by people like uh, Valet and Alexander. And they're all trying to figure out what Corso knew and what he was talking about. If Corso was correct, then there was seated technology. But you can go through and find a, a very good scientific um, basis for the technology that we have today. We can see a, a stream of experimentation and projects and everything else that led there. It didn't suddenly come out of nowhere, our technology. That's a little bit like saying the aliens built the pyramids, you know? So I tend to be very careful of that kind of, of argument that the technology was seeded. I think our entire civilization basically was seeded, was yeah. in response to something that happened thousands of years ago. So in that sense, it's seeded. And maybe as we said in man, there's always the possibility that our genetic code itself was seeded. Yeah. So uh, once you start looking at that, does that mean that they really had to come down and tell us how to make fiber optics? I, I don't know. You know, right. Well, it can be, else. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it could be more secondhand. Yeah. And again, the whole genetic memory idea um, is, is very fascinating. Um, I, you know, I don't, I don't know how much, uh, you know, to the stars, has a position per se, or, you know, where your opinion might differ from Tom's might differ for, you know, from Jim or, you know, however you want to look at that. Um, but I know a lot of people will be curious about, you know, what is, what is the idea from to the stars of, and I don't want to oversimplify this, but mm -hmm. for, you know, to start kind of an idea of, you know, good versus bad, entities non-human intelligence that may be interacting with us people might say oh you know to the stars is trying to say all these non-human intelligence are, are negative they're manipulating us and they're trying to you know paint that picture um so from you know from your perspective or to the stars you know what are some ideas that address uh, you know possibly positive and or negative influences on on our civilization from non-human intelligence um i don't know no, i'm kidding um yeah we do have a um, <laughs> we do have an issue with all of that obviously we we do worry about it we write about it in secret machines uh, i'm pretty sure it'll be covered in war if we haven't done it already in man the The problem is, we're going back to the earlier point, we are projecting human values onto the phenomenon. So we ask ourselves, are they good or bad? Irrelevant. That ethical situation doesn't exist right at this point. We are not talking about people like us. If we were talking about people like us who shared a common ancestry on this planet, had a shared history in some other country, then maybe we could get there. But now we're talking about something we don't, we have no freaking clue the origin of the phenomenon. Therefore, for us to talk about good and evil is, all we can do is say, is it gonna be beneficial towards us or, or is it gonna be negative? Is this, a, is this a liability or an asset being this close in proximity to the phenomenon? We might be able to look at it this way. Does it impact our survival as a race? And I think that's what the military is concerned about not good and evil, not if they're, you know, left or right, Democrat or Republican. What they're worried about is, can they kill us? And if they can kill us, are they going to? And that's all it comes down to. From the military perspective, they think in those terms. Now, that's why we need to get more people than just the military on this. We need to get people who specialize in consciousness, who can think outside the box, and who can say, you know, can give us some scenarios to work with can say that maybe, well, if they didn't come up on our planet, they came in a different, came up in a different planet with a different ecosystem, you know, what would that be like? How would we even communicate? How would they even be able to communicate to us that they are hostile or friendly? How would that even be possible in a language that we would both understand, right? So this is like thrown up in the air. Uh, we have no idea where to start with this thing. We can kind of look at contactee experiences and start taking them seriously. That's a very dangerous area because there's a lot of softness in that. It's not a hard science. It's really soft and kind of mushy. But there are themes that seem to be consistent throughout. And whether it's 
one contactee influencing the other contactee, or whether it's actually direct experience of the phenomenon that's causing these reactions. That's what we have to learn. We have to figure that out. And then we have to try to understand the emotional response that our people, and by our people, I mean human beings in general, have where the phenomenon is concerned when they actually make contact, either with the machine or something that looks like a machine or with a being of some kind. What's the, what's the initial contact? What happens? Do you change? Does your psyche change? Do you have a different viewpoint on the world? What happens? And we try to figure out that way based on those effects, what the phenomenon can do or might do to us based on that. The problem is it's very thorny and it's a lot deeper than just that, but it's a start. And as, we, as I said, I think it's in war. It might be in man, but I think it's in war. At this point, my mind is cream cheese. But there was a, um, a point I was making in one aspect, in one of the volumes about colonization. We know what it is to colonize other countries. The British know that really well. Uh, we know that to a lesser extent, probably not as well as the British, but other countries have done that. They've gone to foreign countries and colonized them. We know from the perspective of the colonizer, we kind of have a lot of literature on that. We went to this country, we took over their country, we took over the raw materials, we took over their people, their governments, everything else. We also need to know the experience, now it's more important than ever, of those who were colonized. How did they survive? What did they think when this foreign army or these foreign people showed up with their foreign languages and foreign customs, et cetera? What was their reaction? How did they handle it? How, what did they experience? Do they have written records of what happened? Oh, so on and so forth. We need to now know from both sides of that conflict what goes on because we've ignored the colonized for a long time. Um, we, you know, we invade a country and we bomb it and then we leave. We, we have to know how they handled it. There's a very interesting story uh, about the Dalai Lama in, uh, in Dharamsala in Nepal. Uh, is that in Nepal or Northern India? Northern India, um, where he invited a bunch of rabbis to come and talk to him because he wanted to know from the rabbis, how did you survive in diaspora? How did you keep your religion together, your culture, your language? How did you manage to do that? Because we as Tibetans now, we've got to figure out how to do that, at least the ones who are in exile. We want to know how that's done. And what we need is a more global approach to this. We need to know because we may be in the position one day of having the, high, the entire planet being colonized. Maybe it's already been colonized, we just don't even know it. So we need to kind of know what our options are, how to deal with it, how to react towards it. So when you're asking about are they evil, are they good, are they demons or angels, that gets us back to a little cabal within government and within the Pentagon and within um, private industry, um, where there is this idea that you don't even talk about the phenomenon. You don't look at it. You don't describe it. You don't analyze it. You don't record it because you're dealing with things you're not supposed to know. And these are evil spirits. They're something that God doesn't want you to know. And as one famous engineer once shouted, you're not supposed to know this until you're dead, right? that famous quotation. So there is a group of people who do resist us understanding more about the phenomenon because they've totally framed it in a religious context. And this is not just me coming up with it or just our advisors telling us this. This has been covered in the news. It's been covered in, in re news reports and the open source. There are people within government, congressmen, people at the Pentagon as well, military people who think that this is something evil, something dangerous. It's satanic. It's, uh, you know, I think it was St. Paul who warned us about, you know, evil coming from the principalities above or something. So we have this, this idea that we are in danger from these things. And it's the best thing to do is to pray, to keep yourself, you know, going to church on Sunday and protect yourself because otherwise these things will come and, and screw with you. So we need to deal with that as well. So it's not just a bunch of hard-nosed pragmatic scientists trying to solve this problem. They are butting heads against a lot of people who have power, who have contacts, who have charge of money in some cases, saying, no, we're not going to explore this. We are not going to study this. It's something from the devil.
it's something satanic and we have to avoid it. And that just makes things even more complicated for any of us who are trying to figure out what to do with this material. Yeah, and that so-called group had an informal name called the Collins Elite, um, which was not supposed to be the real name. Nick Redfern wrote about it. Ray Boucher has written about it. And uh, I had spoken to somebody who told me that their mentor was part of the Collins Elite. And I'll, I'll talk about it now because this researcher is deceased. Um, but he, he claimed that Chuck Misler was his mentor and that Chuck Misler was, was part of this group. And again, I don't know if that's a fact, but he, he certainly fits the build. And if you listen to, to go look up Chuck Misler's talks, you know, even though it's very sophisticated, right. It's sophisticated talking about, you know, these, these entities are, are from hyperspace and they're hyperdimensional entities, and, you know, he's even describing it within a, a context of theoretical physics and, and actually very kind of hip to kind of like ahead of his time as far as a UFO researcher, researcher, but he's citing a lot of biblical stuff and very much has the idea of, you know, the demonic forces. And, you know, they had the idea of just being aware of the UFO phenomenon is inviting the devil or demon demonic forces into our world which, you know, Eric Davis had talked about in an interview that came, um, you know, the people that were responsible for shutting OSAP down were people who had th this kind of ideology, um, which essentially, you know, whether they're right or wrong, we're sticking our head in the sand with that kind of thought. I mean, the, the entities, the beings, uh, they're here, they've been here the whole time. So ignoring them is not going to make them go away clearly. Uh, my, in my opinion, um, although there there is something to that metaphysical aspect of where your attention and awareness is kind of going, uh, even on a collective level, are you opening that up more? I I don't know, right? Um, and you know, even Lou Lou had discussed that Lou Elizondo had discussed that he came into somebody who had a private conversation with him that told him to stop <laughs> the stuff immediately because of because of those ideas. Um, so that, well, I, I found that the, the Air Force Academy is one of the sources for this. The Air Force Academy, I don't know, when I was a kid, like everybody wanted to be in the Air Force. You know, we all wanted to pilot jet planes and do all of this, you know. Um, with my eyes, evidently, I would not pass the uh, flight school. But anyway, but we all wanted to do this. And then as I got older and older, I realized that there's something really weird going on in Colorado Springs, you know. The, the, the Air Force Academy has very strange ideas about their, their role where religion is concerned. You know, people are forced to go to church, from what I understand. Uh, they have some very strange ideas about other religions other than Christianity. Um, and let's face it, it was the Air Force that gave us, uh, you know, some of the worst um, uh, misinformation campaigns, you know, targeting the UFO community. Richard Doty, I'm thinking of. Uh, and the Paul Benowitz situation. I mean, it was the Air Force Academy, right? They they seem to think it's okay to 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 use their intelligence capacity against American citizens. And this is like what you know, and and it's a religious background as well. This is the Air Force. You're in charge of multi million dollar aircraft, and you're talking to me about the devils and angels and all the rest of it. It's a scary situation. So, you know, I I kind of have my my. My, my radar up where it comes to, to the Air Force because there's something really weird going on there. But it's not just the Air Force, obviously. It's just, it's everywhere. And there's this idea, especially now, there's this sort of backlash of evangelical thinking on these things um, where they're lumping a lot of, of the technology that we're seeing and the, the phenomenon itself, they're lumping it in with, you know, devil worshiping and, and Satanism and everything. But I don't, I personally, I don't see the connection, right? Um, but there is something that has always bothered me about the, uh, the famous Tic Tac incidents and, and all of that. And that was the famous case where, and I've mentioned this before, it's something that stays with me and it's the, the, the freakiest thing about this that nobody seems to focus on, is that when the, the pilots were chasing the Tic Tacs, uh, their, their commanders on, on the ship were telling them, um, you know, uh, okay, don't, don't follow them now, you know, meet up at your at your at your at your your CAP, it's it's like a an access point in sky in space, right? The coordinates are you know three dimensional. Meet meet us you know, meet up there, 
And the thing is, nobody knows what that point is. The computer generates that on board ship. So the computer on the ship sends a message to the computer on the plane, says, go to these coordinates. And as they're preparing to go to those coordinates, right, the ship radios them and says, uh, guess what? Those things you were chasing, they're waiting for you at that access point. How the hell did that happen? Yeah. Okay. That's a consciousness trick. That's not technology. The computer itself didn't know the points. It was generated by the computer to meet in a specific location. That's part of our security apparatus. That's how we keep things secret from the enemy. And yet the Tic Tac, whatever the heck the Tic Tac was, knew to meet the aircraft there. We're waiting for it there. How did it know? So this thing has always been bothering me because there doesn't seem to be a rational explanation for it, according to our technology. We then have to make the leap into that murky field of consciousness to describe what's going on, to try to get a handle on it. And once you're in consciousness, you're in that, that space where you've got angels and demons and gods and fairies and elves and Harry Potter. Everybody's in that, <laughs> right? So everybody's in there. They're all jostling for, you know, their position there. So you have a lot of, you know, you have every religion in the world has a piece of that consciousness space. So how is this tic tac? What position does the tic tac hold in that space? You know, so you can have Pentagon people saying, well, they're not Christian. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, you know, but then what? You know, if they're not Christian, then blow them out of the sky. So we're in that mentality. This is the thing that I'm afraid of, right? So this is where we are, this is where we're at. So yeah, it's scary. Uh, it's standing in our way. We can't figure these things out unless all these other people get out of the way so we can take a, a cold, hard, pragmatic look at it. But even as I say that, I realize there's so much of this that's consciousness-based. Right. That's to consciousness. Uh, Jacques Vallée talks about, you know, control mechanism, that the whole UFO experience is like a control mechanism, that we're being, you know, that it's, it's, a, it's a game that somebody's playing on us. John Keel kind of said the same thing. Um, so if that's true, then the science following the science may lead us down the wrong path. Maybe we've got to stop for a second and look someplace else. Right. And I, I, I want to make a small distinction, and maybe this is a flawed interpretation on my behalf, but Valet almost seems to have a thing where it's the control system. It's kind of guiding our evolution, but Keel's perspective is more like it's just a trickster. It's tricking us, leading us down the wrong road, whereas Valet seems to think it's more of a controlled evolution um, and again, that could just be my interpretation. I know Valet does not like when people quote him because yes. I'm just not on that level. And uh, you know, but look so, at it this way. Look, look, look at it this way, though. They could both be right. Right. Yeah. If you look at the, uh, for some reason, I flashed on the tarot deck. Right. On the tarot deck, you have the fool, and the fool is given card number zero. Right. So the fool is the trickster. The fool is this, you know, ultimate trickster. And yet, the fool is kind of the the core, the, the essence of the whole tarot deck itself, you know, so it's the, the, the relationship of the fool to the magician is, is absolute. These are two different faces of the same thing. So the fool is the trickster and the magician is the guided evolution guy. And the fool is the trickster guy, but they're all part of the same deck. And I think that's, that's maybe what we have to look at. I'm always leery of coming down on one side against another right. in this, because I think we're operating in this binary space. And I, I think that's probably wrong. I think it's standing in our way. Right. I, I agree. I think we need a comprehensive and nuanced approach, um, which again, it kind of bypasses our, our normal dualistic uh, paradigms, um, which are so prevalent. But again, again, we, I think we have to rise to the occasion and use this as an opportunity to, you know, take it up a notch, if I can say yeah. that, yeah. Um, you know, there's a, oh, wow, there's so much I want to talk about the so the the phenomenon right whether it's phenomenon as in a singular intelligence or possibly you know several different phenomena um you know the ufo phenomenon itself could at any point could have and and could just disclose itself at any point we know that right it obviously has that potential but it doesn't so do you th do you think that part of the the the, the UFO cover up has been enforced or influenced in any way by the phenomenon? 
Well, you're, there, there's an implication in what you're saying that there is a, a plan or a method or a strategy on behalf of the phenomenon. And that may not be so. It may just be living its life, you know? Right. It wasn't until the last hundred years that we were in their space. We had never been in space. We had never been in the air. We never had an airplane until the Wright brothers, basically. We had balloons and they came and went down. They were not, you know, that useful. But we did invent, you know, planes. It was in the beginning of the 20th century. For thousands of years, we lived on the ground. So whenever we saw the phenomenon, it's when they just appeared over where we were. Um, and it was there. And Jacques Vallée co-authored a book on this, um, a very thick book looking at the historical, you know, sightings going back down to the earliest recorded sightings. And they were there. The, the phenomenon was there. And it was discussed and described almost exactly like we do it today. But then suddenly, within the turn of the century, the late 1800s to the early 1900s, now we're in the we're in the air. We've invaded their territory, right? I call it the, the government of the sky. We went and invaded their territory. We have planes up there. My God, do we have planes? We had all kinds of aircraft up there in the last hundred years. We've had jet aircraft, propeller aircraft. We've had rockets that we've sent to the moon and, and satellites that we've sent to the far reaches of our, of our solar system. We've, we've suddenly gone where they are. And I think that may be one of the reasons why this has picked up speed or seemed to have picked up speed so much recently is that we're now all over the place. I mean, we go off the coast of California with our jets and suddenly the Tic Tacs are there, right? We would never have seen them before, right? We would have these sailboats and we're out there and we have our sextants and our astrolabes trying to figure out where the hell we are. Now we've got this equipment and we're out there like crazy. We're sending up uh, jets from the deck of our, of our aircraft carriers out into their area. We are pressing on them. We are in a sense, invading their space, literally and figuratively. So maybe what's happening is they're just reacting to us. And maybe it's like a, a normal, almost an organic reaction to our presence initially. And I think that after we had made ourselves known to them, they started paying more attention. They started visiting our missile bases and our nuclear facilities and started screwing with us just to see what would happen. Maybe this testing behavior is strictly that. It's testing behavior. Let's turn off an entire missile system and see how they react. Oops, they're getting nervous. Turn it back on again. You know, or let's let's fake the Russians into thinking that the United States is attacking them. That should be fun, right? That's a scary incident, which I, I've heard Tom talk about. Uh, you know, it is there in the literature, but I had first had it brought to my attention for, you know, when Tom discussed it and mm -hmm. that. I had no idea, um, you know, a, a number of years ago is that, you know, for us, they were like shutting our things off. And yeah. in, in Soviet Union, Russia, they were per putting them into launch yeah. <laughs> sequence, yeah. basically. Yeah. Uh, exactly. They were just saying, let's just see what happens, right? It, yeah. got to, it got to the point, I talk about this in war, it got to the point where there was one military base, Russian, Soviet base, where they figured out how to make them show up. You know, they knew that if they did certain movements, if they started moving equipment around in a certain way, suddenly these things would show up like the, you got their attention, almost like, you know, shaking a, a, a thread in front of a cat, they would suddenly go crazy. So if they started moving their equipment around on this particular base and acted like they were getting ready to do something, the phenomenon would show up. There would be lights in the sky suddenly. There would be interference coming from, from that source. They began to, to do, you know, physical gestures at them. You know, they tried to make them move in a certain way. They would wave their arms back and forth. It was weird stuff. But the Soviets were doing this. There's I, no reason that we didn't do the same thing. But we know the Soviets did because they wrote about it. The generals after the fall of the Soviet Union were quite open discussing this. Yeah. And I, I don't I don't want to, you know, give anything up for you. I know it's, you know, in, in your book or whatever. But is, is there any public sourcing for that? Or you can, can you give anybody breadcrumbs or leads on oh, that? No, it's, public, it's publicly sourced. I, I don't do anything that I got on the QT from anybody. Right, right. So, so where sourced. where can people look more into that into that dimension? Volume three is coming out. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I know you. It's a yeah. I I know okay. you want to to be to be serious about it. Um, 
I don't know off the top of my head, but I can send you an email with the actual source and, and find it. You know. Please do. And, and for people watching, listening, I'm going to add that into description because I know that's a very highly, I mean, again, I think when, if people read that, they're going to be more inclined even to, to, to read the book and get the book and see the fuller context in the, in the war um, book. And I really encourage people to do it because again, um, you know, you're going to get one of Peter's books and you will spend like weeks and weeks and weeks just looking at the different sources and it's going to drive you a little crazy, yeah. but you're going to, you're going to learn, you're going to learn a lot. Yeah. And um, again, that's, that is a very fascinating case. Cause I had read about that sparsely here and there over the years and again, like what you said in the, the motioning of the hands to see right. if they would respond in which they did yeah. uh, move and it seemed to be this interactive component, right. which, you know, I'm involved in, I've had a lot of, a number of experiences that were interactive throughout my life. So I understand that component. So seeing that on a, on a scale like that, you know, with a government involved to some extent and, and witnessing that is, yeah. is a big deal. I think, and I, and that's something that needs to be taken note of, right? Like how, you know, if we're able to interact that way, um, well, and, and that gets into a few questions I have. Um, the, you, you've brought up before microtubules, right? In, yeah. in some context and, and possibly how that has involvement in interaction. Is there anything you can say about that? Wow. Uh, okay. Well, I mentioned it I know, first. Yeah. In, in, that's, that's dense material. But I mentioned it first in Sinister Forces. Uh, in, the, in the third book, I go into a whole long explanation of the microtubules and the, the connection with consciousness and the quantum effect and all of that. Uh, and then I do it again in, uh, in Man, I believe, um, in, in Secret Machines Man. Uh, this is a thing that was very controversial for a while, uh, but now seems to be somewhat less so. And that is that. Um, Stuart Hameroff, who is a, 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 has a PhD in anesthesia, in the science of anesthesia, and Roger Penrose, the famous mathematician and scientist, they kind of got together and developed this theory of what's called the microtubules in the brain. These are very tiny, tiny aspects of your nervous, of the, uh, the brain's structure. And their idea was that the, the microtubules were the connection between the human brain and consciousness and the quantum universe. That consciousness was a quantum effect taking place in the brain. And they were ridiculed for this from a lot of people saying, no, it's not possible. You can't get a quantum effect in the brain. The brain is too hot, it's too moist. It's gotta be close to uh, uh, actual zero. Uh, in order for you know quantum effects to take place, you need extremely you know cold temperatures and blah blah blah. So they had all these these arguments. And then in the last I think ten years or so, it's been revealed that um, photosynthesis, which we all know that plants use sunlight to create you know energy to create food for the for the plants to grow, uh, create chlorophyll and all the rest of it. The photosynthesis process is a quantum process. And if photosynthesis is a quantum process, then quantum effects happen in natural temperatures and ambient temperatures. I mean, I'm probably losing 90% of your audience right now. But the point that I'm trying to make, and I'll get you right back to it, is that our brains are quantum computers. We can, we have, we are capable of creating effects that would be considered quantum effects. It would explain mental telepathy, it would explain psychokinesis, it would explain a lot of this phenomena that we uh, studied at uh, various universities and ESP research and that sort of thing, that you could actually measure it if you had the right equipment and perhaps even you know, develop these abilities in your brain because the, the microtubules themselves are is the net, is the network inside the brain that causes this. Well, Hameroff and, and uh, Penrose were so convinced of this, so they actually gave um, talks to the military, to the Pentagon about weaponizing paranormal abilities, right? They said, this could be weaponized. You could actually create equipment or machines or people, train people to use this, to do remote viewing, to do the, all the sort of things that the military you know, projects were trying to do, but you have to shift your focus to the actual physical 
uh, a medium, which is the microtubule networks in the brain, and somehow activate them or control them or map them to the point where you can actually then create these paranormal effects. To me, that was just absolutely stunning and, and fascinating because here was a scientific basis, potentially, for all of this, you know, the paranormal stuff that we experience. And is it possible then that this is the this is the matrix with through which we are making contact with the phenomenon? Is that how it's happening? Is this a quantum effect that we're witnessing? And of course, that just opens up, you know, a whole can of worms on where science and consciousness and people fighting over is consciousness, you know, an emergent property of the brain, which right. is the Chalmers, you know, uh, concept. And I've always said it's the opposite, you know, the brain is an emergent property of consciousness. You know, our brain is, is being created to, by consciousness, to talk to itself. And which is what a lot of religions have said, that, that God created humans in order to, to witness and to appreciate the creation, you know, to, in, to make matters short. So the idea that it's there, this, consist, this concept is there. So the, uh, the microtubules, yeah, it's, it's very long and it's very detailed. And my explanation of it is um, right now is, is inferior to what you'll find in the books. If you go to the to Sinister Forces and to Secret Machines Man, uh, you'll find a more detailed explanation of the microtubules there. Yeah, and, and forgive me if I'm mis mistaking this. That, did, had you discussed an angle where microtubules could have been um, involved in somehow the abduction phenomenon? I don't think I've discussed it, okay. but I, I, I can understand why that would be so. A person who's being abducted um, has a, a very specific set of responses, and it seems that, you know, John Mack was aware of this. He was mapping it with people with having um, a, a post-traumatic stress disorder because of the abduction experiences. So he knew that there was an effect on consciousness. His critics were saying, well, they're just psychologically weird. This is a psychological problem. It's a psychological disease or a psychological effect. And Mac is saying, yeah, but where does it come from? I've always had this, this attitude where the contactee experience is concerned that we know eyewitness testimony is notoriously unreliable, right? A crime is committed. You've got five witnesses. They have five different accounts of the crime. It was the guy was tall, he was short, he was black, he was white, he was fat, he was thin, he had a gun, he had a knife. They all have different things. So you can't rely upon it. Therefore, you can't rely upon the contact he experienced, except for one thing. All these witnesses to the crime witnessed a crime. A crime took place. They saw it. Their impression of it was different. What they saw depended on them, depended upon who they were, where they were, what they were thinking at the time. It was a big guy because you maybe you're small and he looked very big. Maybe you were frightened and you automatically thought that the person was bigger. On and on and on. But the crime took place. With the contactees, something happened. And that was, that was John Mack's approach as well. Something happened. And it was not normal. It was out of the normal. It was not human. It was something else that took place that caused this reaction. So, you know, consciousness may be simply the the matrix through which these effects are felt, but it still, it still means there is something out there that was affecting your brain in this way, making you think you were abducted and worse, right? So something is taking place. That doesn't mean we have to believe every contactee exactly what they said literally, but it does mean we have to take contactees seriously and try to analyze that aspect of the phenomenon because there's a missing piece there. And do you think that some of these experiences could be psychically induced or, at, you know, astrally psychically induced, if we can say it like that? Um, that ringing of the bell meant yes. <laughs> um, I don't know where that ringing is come. It could be from my computer and I can't turn it off. Um, I mean, we're using words. Right. Of defining them. So when we say astral and psychic, and we say, you know, microtubules and consciousness and the contact experience, that's almost a word salad. It's like really hard to pull it all apart and to identify it, right? Because we're still dealing with the major big unknown, which is the phenomenon itself. So we're trying to figure out why that's happening the way it is. And we're using words that we kind of know have meaning, but it's going to mean something to some, something different to somebody else. Right. So psychic will mean something different. Astral will mean something different. 
ghost demons, spirits will mean something different. Aliens. Yeah, creating an artificial consciousness experience. I mean, yeah, we could yeah. dress it up in many exactly. ways. And still not get anywhere. <laughs> right. Simulation. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. Right. That's why I really hesitate to use that language as much as I can. Yeah. Um, do, I mean, so do you think, but again, if we're, we're hypothesizing or mm -hmm. speculating, do you think that could possibly be the case in, in any scenario? Again, I don't know what the words yeah. mean. Okay. Yeah. Um, Fair enough. It's like, what can I make as a good example? People have religious experiences. Right. Right. What are those? Right. If they see God, Moses, right, and the burning bush, or Abraham being told to kill his son Isaac, right? And then God saying, ah, never mind. <laughs> where does that come from i mean what is that how do you define that was that an astral thing was that a simulation was that we don't know right because we're not spending enough time analyzing this stuff we are not we're just we're trying to explain it away so that we don't have to look at it yeah. like we do with the phenomenon we're trying to explain it away we can't do that anymore right now we've got to get serious we've got to get damn serious and understanding what consciousness is and how it's operating and how it's affecting us and how we affect it. We have to get to that point. We're not there yet. So anything that I say is like kind of meaningless because we don't have a common vocabulary for it yet. Yeah. Understood. Um, so the rest of our conversation is over. <laughs> it's great talking to you, Peter. Um, so, Okay, this this is going to be super controversial, and I, you know, again, I don't want to put like to the stars or you in the, in a hot seat or whatever. Um, but the idea of that the the phenomenon is among us, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's been talks about the you know non human intelligence literally walking among us. Bob Robert Bigelow has discussed it a number of times. Um, human looking non human entities, um, you know. In, to those you know those kind of ideas um you know what do you what do you think of that well i can go back to my own infamous men in black experience which i'm sure you've heard me talk about no cool this is new all right many years ago it was at the time of the first gulf war i remember it from that point of view i was living in a small town in new england in Rhode Island, in the middle of nowhere, basically. Um, and I was living in a house. There was a driveway that goes down to a highway. I mean, a, not a highway, a two-lane road. And I'm coming back from shopping. I'm unloading the car. So this was about 1990, I guess. And I, know, I look up and I notice an old model black Cadillac parked in front of my house with somebody with a wide angle lens taking my picture. And I'm freaking out, like, what the hell is this all about, right? I put down the groceries and I run over to the car. I wanna see what's going on. Like, this is a small town in New England. This stuff doesn't happen. The car takes off. So I said, I'm gonna follow the car. I run back to my car. I'm gonna get in the car and drive off and follow this guy. When another car pulls into my driveway blocking me, and it's another old car, it's a sedan, uh, a station wagon rather, with you know with the wood paneling, you know these really old cars, and inside are two little women. They look like Manson family members, right? They're kind of like squeaky from looking, and they get out of the car to ask me directions, effectively stopping me from following the Cadillac. And they ask me, they say, um, do you know where De Vilbis, De Vilbis lives? This is imprinted on my mind, right? I'm looking at that, like, what the hell? No, I never heard of, De, you know, go away, right? <laughs> they get out of the car, they're wearing these cloth coats, you know, these weird, like old fashioned garments, an old fashioned car, and they're sort of, you know, cream complexion, sort of reddish hair types. And they're looking at me very sweetly. Do you know where Devilibus is? And I say, no. They get back in the car, drive away. By that time, it's too late for me to follow the Cadillac. 
stupidly, I didn't realize this car was part of that operation, whatever it was, right? Because they effectively came and blocked me and made sure I couldn't follow them, which means that they were right, right there, right behind the other car, which I did not see. There you go. So I'm, I'm kind of like freaked out. I don't know where this came from. So I do a search. I'm looking for De Vilbis. There is no De Vilbis in the entire state of Rhode Island. Didn't exist. There was no such name, right? But there was a De Vilbis in Ohio. They had a factory that made equipment. And I realized that I had known that factory's name because a year previously or so, I had contacted them with uh, an inquiry about something. So De Vilbis was in my brain, but it only exists out there thousand miles away from, from Rhode Island in this weird little obscure factory. And the name popped into my brain. Okay, fine. Weird, but can't explain it, don't know. A few years later, about almost 10 years later, I'm in the airport in Singapore. I'm trudging through the airport. I was based in Kuala Lumpur at the time in Malaysia. Uh, frequently, I would fly into Singapore from other countries and stuff and catch a flight to Kuala Lumpur. And I'm dragging my suitcase through Singapore. When somebody hits me on the, th on the shoulder, on my left shoulder, taps me on the shoulder, I stop and I turn around. It's one of the girls from the car. And she kind of waves at me and smiles and walks away. I turn around and I go chasing after her. She's gone. I don't know where she went, but she hit me. I hadn't even thought about these people in that amount of time, right? They just ceased to be an issue. But that came, make it, made it come flooding all the way back. Just hit me on the shoulder, hi, we're here, and took off. It's important to realize that I never had a UFO sighting at this point. Never yeah. saw a UFO, but I saw men in black. Like, why is that? The guys in the black caddy were like, you know, cookie stamp men in black guys, right? And then they're followed by these two women in the weird station wagon with the wood paneling. This is just the weirdest thing. So what was your question? <laughs> Uh, my question was, uh, you know, non-human intelligence walking among us, whether uh, they they could pass for human or whether they're able to take that form and interact with us in that way. As far as I'm concerned, that's what that was. Now, I have no scientific basis for that. It's just that the accumulation of things that had happened made me think that, um, that, that I was looking at something that was trying to look normal, but was like 30, 40 years out of date which is the men in black experience, right? That's always something that's too old and it's, it's just, it's not quite right. It doesn't quite, it's not quite the same. And this seemed that way. It seemed, my, my impression I've always said was like, these were like Manson family women. It, they were not, it was the, my reaction to that. It's as if they cloaked themselves in something that I would see. And they stopped me from doing what I was going to do because I was gonna chase that car wherever it was and figure out who they were. And I was unable to do that even though I had in front of me the actual proof, these two girls in the car, which was part of the same thing, had to be. And I could have followed them instead. But, it, but instead, I was too discombobulated by the experience. And I realized the car was gone. And I gave up before realizing, wait a minute, it was a two-car team, right? Yeah. So I don't know. So do I think it's positive? True. Yes. Timothy Good once told me, or he may have read it, uh, written it in one of his books. I've been looking for it in the books, and I can't find it. But I'm fairly certain it was Timothy Good. Because uh, I, I, I did a thing with him in Amsterdam years ago, right? We were on the same panel at a UFO thing, a secret space program thing. And uh, we, we, we shared a bottle of scotch there. And when I shared a bottle of scotch, I mean, we both drank half the bottle of scotch, um, which was an interesting thing, getting drunk with Timothy Good, right? That must have been awesome. <laughs> that was awesome, actually. And um, there was this thing he said, he said, you want to see if that's true with the NHIs walking among us and all the rest of it. He says, prove it for yourself. Go to any public place, go to any crowded place. He, he suggested an, an airport, you know, an airport terminal. A lot of people all milling around. Just sit somewhere peacefully and quietly. Just wait, take a few deep breaths and say, okay, show yourself. You know, I want to see that you're here. I'm here. He says, give it a little, give it a little time, then open your eyes. You're going to see somebody staring straight at you and smiling and then walking away and disappearing. He says, try it. He says, it works every time. So it's just that we're not making the effort. Yeah. Identify them.
And I, I have a video. I, I've been making this small series called Walking Among Us, and I, I've threaded together clips of like people like James Fox, Bob Bigelow, and uh, you know uh, Robert Dean, and others talking about non-human intelligence that could pass somehow in our society or inter- interact with us. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I didn't um, edit it in yet, but I have, a, I have that clip of timothy good telling his story of two encounters he had like that oh, good. Right. um so i could i can send you those links absolutely um so this, this we're gonna we're gonna shift the conversation here a little bit um into i guess what we can say you know again all these terms like you said are loaded and don't mean anything but occultism right uh the occult or metaphysics I mean, do you think that in in having an understanding, and again, or, or familiar familiarity, right? Not even the understanding of of metaphysics and metaphysical systems and the occult, um, is helpful in understanding the phenomenon, or, or or in in taking a broader view of the phenomenon. Well, I write about that subject a great deal. Um, so that means yes. No. Um, to me, my interest in the occult is the technology of it. To me, occultism is a technology. I kind of like to strip it of the ideology or right, strip religion right. of the ideology. There's too much ideology involved in all of this. Right. If you look at ancient religions, if we kind of get past ideological statements and positions, when they talk about experience, that's when it becomes interesting. I mentioned the Dalai Lama and the rabbis. Another aspect of that meeting was while the Dalai Lama was talking to the rabbis about various ideological things, there was another group of monks, of of Tibetan monks, who just wanted to talk to the rabbis about mystical practices. How do you do this and how do you do that, right? And they were comparing notes. Jewish Kabbalists and Tibetan monks, Tibetan Buddhist monks, We're now comparing notes on how do you do this. That, to me, is the core of this. Occultism is a technology. And if we get past some of the the nonsense about it, and we just look at the methods, the methods will tell you what you need to know. The methods in occultism are probably methods that we could use and apply towards understanding the phenomenon. And it's been done, right? I mean, uh, mean, I've I've done it. (laughs) I've done it. There you go. At one point, CIA was investigating occultism for their their mind control programs, right? They they wanted to see how that worked. Um, I think Nick Redfern writes about it in Collins' Elite, the Sybil Leak, you know, but he also throws in Crowley and Jack Parsons and everybody else in that book. So it's, you know, it's like the kitchen sink. But there's there's a kind of a method behind it, though, because these were all people who looked at occultism as the technology, not as a ideology to shove down someone's throat but as a series of steps of practices to take to, to alter your, your brain, to alter consciousness. And uh, a book that I've been working on, nothing to do with secret machines, but for the last few years, has been understanding how the body is the vehicle for experience and how the body itself is a, is a kind of machine that can be used for understanding and even creating and, and partaking in experience. That the body is a set of... Um, uh, well, like the microtubules, it's a, it's a it's a machine that can be programmed, that can be operated, that can we can use ourselves uh, to see what's really going on. So um, that's to me is fascinating. So occultism, from that point of view, uh, is fascinating. And in Secret Machines, um, Gods, I wrote about that specifically. I wrote about occultism. I wrote about the idea of the magic circle with the lights on it being a kind of simulacrum of the lights in the sky, of a saucer with lights at the edges, of how they were duplicating something that they saw and the the magician would stand in the middle of this and it was considered extremely dangerous to leave it which if you were an alien maybe in a you know in a flying saucer you were probably told the same thing exactly stay inside the circle with the lights don't don't leave it you know weird things happen those people out there are crazy you know? so um it could be something of that nature you know that there's an occult occultism uh, phenomenon more direct path than we than we know but I think that there is. I think that anything that involves manipulating consciousness, your own, hopefully, just you yourself manipulating your consciousness, is going to make you more aware 
of how to approach the subject of the phenomenon. It's going to give you extra tools and an extra perspective for understanding it. And maybe if you do come across it, you'll be better able to, to react to it in a, in a kind of positive way. By that, I mean get information of, about the experience and be able to communicate it to someone else, even if you have to use a cult language to do it. Right. And, and that's kind of the idea of upaya in, in Buddhism is skillful means. Right. Um, you know, how, how can you skillfully navigate and, and, and relate and utilize that kind of thing? And, you know, I, you know, I can't let you off the hook here, Peter, you mentioned a new book you're working on. Is that, is that an actual book that you're, that you're, that's going to be released soon? Oh, no, no. I'm still working on it. I have an of information. Oh, man, that's, that's something that's right up my alley. Cause again, I've practiced, you know, Kriya yoga, Chan, you know, some Tibetan practices, you know, people are going to be familiar with rainbow body, uh, Merkaba, um, all those kind of, again, technologies. And in, in, in my experience to have an enhanced in my own mind, uh, my experience and, um, capability to some extent regarding navigating the phenomenon. Um, so, so man, yeah. That, is, is there a timeline for that book or it's just like a side project? It's a side project. I wish I, I knew. Is, I, I want to finish it this year. So that's as much of a timeline that I have right now. It's my, now that I've said it, I'm probably just screwed it. But anyway, this is, this is my idea is to finish it this well, year. That, Cause I'm going to have to have you on when that comes out, Peter. Appreciate it. I, I mean, that's, again, that's really, to me, when you're getting into that, you're getting cl cl closer to the core of the phenomenon. And I know that's hard for some people to relate to because they're thinking, you know, these physical craft and occupants and crash retrievals, which are all valid and important things. But I mean, my, in, for me, on an experiential, you know, experiential, very real level, mm -hmm. those it kind of interactions and experiences have been critical to my own kind of journey. Um, in that, in that book, are you, are you going to include a how to, is there going to be. <laughs> uh, kind of in a way, I mean, I was inspired um, by a, a friend of mine who's now deceased, who. Uh, Alice making... Crowley. No, I'm kidding. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Close. But who was making some statements about um, regarding gender sexuality and occultism. And it, the statement pissed me off. I mean, it, it bothered me. It, 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 it made me realize that people were thinking about things the wrong way. I mean, at least from my perspective. So I went back and I said, let me do some research on this whole field because I've been studying it anyway. I've got stacks of stuff here. I've been studying uh, all the various tantras. I've been you know, going deep dives into all sorts of weird stuff, um, trying to figure out where the connection is you know, between, for instance, gender and sexuality, for instance, the human body and consciousness. You know, what, how are these things related? Are they related biologically, genetically? You know, where are, the, where are the reasons that they give? Practitioners, what did they say How about this? And so I started going into that and then I wound up all kinds of strange places, um, including with, um, you know, French postmodernism and God knows what else, it's all there, right? So it's all there and it's all giving me a kind of renewed perspective on how we should approach this problem. And, uh, you know, you mentioned Aleister Crowley. Crowley had very sort of old fashioned ideas about this. I mean, he was, he was an interesting person. He experimented a lot in all different kinds of ways, but I think at heart, he was still kind of conservative in his approach to this material. He didn't have access to what we have access to now. He didn't have access to the Tantras, for instance. He didn't really, yeah. they were not really available. Um, he didn't have access to what we now know of ancient Christian and Gnostic practices. That stuff wasn't available yet. The Dead Sea Scrolls, you know, were uncovered in 1947, the year that he died. So there was a lot of material that he didn't have access to. But if he had access to, he might have mellowed out a little bit and, you know, seen a different way to, to approach this. But anyway, so it just got me in that, in that area where I've just been exploring all of this at the, uh, at some depth, and it's um, I realize this is an enormous subject to try to get your arms around, because there's so many different points of view and so many different practices, but they eventually come down to a handful. They come down to breathing. They come down to meditation. They come down to uh, you know manipulating the senses, and what does the phenomenon do to us but manipulate our senses? 
I mean, it's doing it from the opposite side, right? It is manipulating our senses. If we can manipulate our senses, perhaps that's our path to understanding the phenomenon. Instead of being the receivers, we can be at least transmitters or active participants in the, make it a two-way communication instead of just this one way of the phenomenon telling you what it is and telling you disasters are coming, the world's going to be destroyed. They always seem to tell the contactees. Uh, they seem to give all these dire warnings all the time. Um, it would be nice to have a two-way com conversation. Well, you know? and you know, that's very much what I'm involved in and what contact work is about. And I've, I've done many kind of experiments utilizing different techniques and methods and approaches, you know, um, you know, from Kriya Yoga to, to utilizing, you know, a meta, meta practice in, mm -hmm. in trying to initiate, uh, you know, um, an interaction um, and, you know, conscious based exercises, which, which in my experience have worked, uh, you know, to different levels, but obviously some of that is going to be relying on the phenomenon and if, and when, and why, and how it wants to interact. But uh, there's, there's definitely something to be said about all that is, is there in, in the book or in, in your own, I guess I can say philosophy or practice, are there, do you have any inc inclination towards certain approaches or do you think some systems are more comprehensive that you are aware of or appreciate? No, um, I don't think any, I don't think, I think it depends upon your own makeup. Right. your own context as a person, like where you're coming from personally, what's going to be easier for you to do. But there's an interesting book that came out uh, not that long ago. Uh, Moise Idel was one of the authors. It, he co-authored it. Moise Idel is this famous Kabbalist. Uh, he followed in the footsteps of Gershom Sholem, the famous guy who wrote, you know, major trends in Jewish mysticism. He opened up Kabbalah or Kabbalah uh, to the academic community and became an important figure. Uh, in his shoes, in his, you know, abs after Sholem died, uh, Moise Idel, a uh, Romanian uh, Jewish guy, uh, has done remarkable work in this area. He's written The Primeval Evil, for instance. He's written about the Gollum, huge, thick academic books with all these citations. But then he co authored this very thin book with a, a, a neuroscientist in which they analyzed Kabbalistic stories from the point of view of neurology and neuropsychiatry. And it's like phenomenal. It's a, it's a thin book, but it's extremely comprehensive. And I don't see it within arm's reach. Um, it might be in another room, but it's yeah. it's just, it's called Kabbalah something else. Look up Moise Idel. It's a, he co-authored, he hardly ever co-authors a book. This is the only one I think that he co-authored. And it's, every page is kind of luminous with discussing the biology of the conscious states that the Kabbalists entered into. And yeah. that to me is fascinating. That might help. It's, it's like an interesting way to look at it. If you're familiar with Kabbalah at all, this will help you understand, you know, how from a neurological point of view, what's going on. It's great yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah I, that, that sounds fascinating to me. I'm going to have to look that up myself. Um, and uh I know you talked about a little bit of in gods, but do you, so do you think like the the Merkaba practice has um, utilization in that way? Well, I wrote a book called Stairway to Heaven, uh, which talked about Merkaba and Hechalot mysticism, but like from the Kabbalistic point of view, right? So it's it's kind of it's not dry necessarily, but the the point is is that these were ways for us to duplicate the celestial ascent. Yeah. So how do the Kabbalists do it? Uh, they had these, these early texts um, that were based on Merkava mysticism and Hechalot mysticism going back very, very far, the earliest days of Kabbalah, probably before Zohar, before all of that. And these were methods that they, they were just methods, they were techniques that the, um, the Kabbalists would use to enter into these consciousness states. And they would ascend on the, the seven levels, right? So there's the famous story of the four rabbis who entered paradise. Uh, three went in, uh, four went in, only one came out, um, Rabbi Akiva. So it, it's, a, it's a great story about how each one failed to understand where they were, failed the ascent until Rabbi Akiva made it. 
And of course it's couched in Jewish symbolism, but it's easy to understand it because so much of the occult symbolism since then is based upon this idea of seven stages going to the throne of God at the end. Um, the Kabbalists did that. Um, I believe that the people who were involved in the cult of Mithra were doing the same thing. I wrote about that in that same book. Um, and of course, then it came to the modern occultists like the Golden Dawn, groups like that were doing the same thing. There was this element of Merkava mysticism there rising on the different planes. And of course, in Islam, uh, the prophet did the same. He, wrote, he rose on these various heavens, met various prophets along the way. It was just the same concept. And it goes back to ancient Egypt, where the Pharaoh, after the mummification process, uh, ascended to heaven, riding to the, up to the, to the North Star, uh, to the Pole Star. So, and the entrance to the Pole Star is seven stars, the seven stars of the, of the Dipper. And each of those stars was given a name that you would go up to, to the very end, which is why I say our entire civilization is a cargo cult. We're all trying to get up those seven stars to this pole star, because that's the symbol of immortality. We have equated space travel with immortality in our minds, and we're still doing that. And it's still motivating everybody who's involved in the space program and in longevity medicine and everything else. We're all basically being triggered by those initial ideas. Something happened to us, like I say, at some point in far history, which has pushed us on this path. That's a really roundabout way of answering your question. Yeah, but well, you know, Merkava and Hechalot uh, mysticism to me is, it's prefigured in almost every culture. The shamans in Siberia were doing the same thing, climbing a tree uh, to, to ascend to the heavens and to bring down information from the stars. It's, it's, it's identical, you know, in, in its general approach to the problem. Yeah, because there was almost, you can say, like a, re a revival of the Merkaba uh, approach with even within the new age. Right. Um, sure. So I, I know people that were doing that and they kind of made a splash again in the eighties and nineties. And even right. in today, you know, with the, the flower of life work and the sacred geometry, and they involved the Merkaba in that, that, you know, tetrahedral mm -hmm. fields mm -hmm. um, and, you know, actually trying to create um an electromagnetic field using the Merkaba practice around your body as a, you know, a vehicle for, you know, you know, sight, you know, even um, mm -hmm. interdimensional travel and all, you know, all these kind of ideas. Um, so I, you know, I found that interesting. And, and one of the people who was talking about a lot about that had a background in Rosicrucianism at one point and the order of Melchizedek um, stuff like yeah, that. You're very big with the Merkaba stuff. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So I, I found that fascinating. Um, but I actually have um, some questions here from one of my friends. Okay. Uh, his name's Corey Jacques Keel or Jacques Keel is like a you know Jacques Vallee and 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 uh, and John mm -hmm. Keel combination. That's his like tag name. Um, he says, uh, "Is there any material out of Secret Machines books one and two that?" You haven't seen the community include in the conversation what we have, what have we already missed? So anything from those two books that you think are important that isn't talked about too much? The community is not really talking about secret machines all that much. Um, it is, and and the, some of the themes they are, but yeah, you know, they're composite, are. you know. I think people read into secret machines. They're looking for something in secret machines that they're hoping to find. Um, they're looking for, you know, uh, clues at the scene of the crime, you know? And um, what they're getting is, is a lot of demanding um, material that's really asking them to, to, to work on. For instance, okay, um, the, the way we anthropomorphize the alien, if there is such a thing as an alien, whatever is behind the phenomenon. This anthropomor anthropomorphization that we're doing, my God, I can't get that out. I need, yeah. more, I need more coffee for sure. But it's, it's it, for instance, I talk uh, in man, for instance, a, a lot about how we view the alien. And there's some very important points, I think, to my mind. 
And that is there, there, there are physical similarities that people seem to, to share when they talk about the aliens. They're talking about big eyes and a large head, a virtually insignificant mouth, nose, um, a small torso, you know, arms and legs kind of, no genitals of any kind. Um, when you stop and think about it, what does that mean? What are they describing? What planet or what environment would that being come from? Does the fact that it has virtually no mouth and no ears that we can see, unless it's like Spock ears on some of these drawings, does that mean that there's no physical communication? Is that why the abductees claim that they're being spoken to telepathically? Is the telepathy not a choice, but is it a requirement because the beings do not speak? There are no vocal cords. They do not hear, there are no ears. So there's no acoustic situation with the alien. It's strictly a mental communication process, as an example. In other words, analyze what people are saying about their experiences and see if there's similarities across uh, different experiences and see if we can come up with an idea as to what they're talking about. Is this organic or is it inorganic? If the being, if they're taken aboard a spacecraft with these beings, and they always describe the spacecraft in certain ways, right? Sometimes it's a laboratory, sometimes there's just lights or there's whatever. As I often point out, there's never a wastebasket, you know? Why is that? There is never any place for dealing with waste at all. The beings themselves don't seem to create any waste. You never see an alien sneeze <laughs> or pass gas, for instance, <laughs> which scares me even thinking about what that might be like. So none of that's happening. Does that mean, does that automatically de facto, is that a statement towards us? We are not organic, right? And if we are not organic, are we created? Are we machines? Have we been, are we cyborgs? Are we androids? Are we robots? You know, is that what they're trying to let us know? Is the craft designed for robots? Obviously not designed for creature comforts if you're an organic being, right? So really what's happening there? What, what information can we derive from this? I'm surprised people don't go back and look at all these uh, abductee cases and contactee cases and start building the database. That would you know, start to tend to make us believe a certain way about the contact experience and about the alien behind it. I think that's, that's kind of missing. It's like, guys, pay attention. There's something going on here. You know, there's something that we may be able to, to understand. For instance, I said in another, I think another posting or another somewhere, the alien doesn't sing. Right? There's no music on a spacecraft. There's no, on a saucer or whatever, there's no singing. There's no, there's no music at all. So, you know, it's like the safety dance video. You know, if your friends can't sing, and, you know, they're no friends of mine. So is it possible <laughs> that, you know, they don't, that they don't sing? That the things that we take for granted is what I'm, try, that's what I'm trying to get at. It's a very clinical setting with the contactees. It's always freaking clinical like you're going to the doctor's office, but even our doctors, you know, don't look like this. These are things that are not doctors in that way. And why are they so obsessed with human reproduction? Is it because quite frankly, they do not reproduce? That the, the thing that you saw today when your contactee experience has been here for 10,000 years doing the same thing, right? Maybe, because they don't, they don't go bad, they don't rot, they don't die, they don't age. It's the same thing over and over and over again. So I, I'm thinking that there's a lot, there's a wealth of material, of material there that we could maybe come up with some ideas, if not conclusions, at least, at least have the right questions to ask the next time yeah. you're affected. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, then some people have posed the idea and that, you know, even um, Bryce Zabel made a film that was like a four TV film called uh, Real Official Denial or, right. or I think I heard it. <laughs> it's, it's along those lines is the title. It was a great short film. Uh, and it, it was like, um, you know, you have the entities that look like the greys and they ended up, you know, the, the guy gets on the ship and he finds that their database computer thing and they, they're going through names and he discovers that these entities were actually us from the future who, you know, mm -hmm. uh, some kind of, you know, different timeline future where things got out of hand and they just, they, they were coming to get their own DNA so they can repair what they, you know, had mm -hmm. damaged, you know, by this obsession with technology mm -hmm. and, um, you know, went down that path and they were trying to correct that. So 
I mean, you know, again, that's a kind of an, an interesting theory idea. You know, it's, you know, do, do um, some governments have biological samples that would support that? I have no idea, you know, but I, that, that's why the idea of like, you know, so much data being withheld is like with everything being withheld where the way it is, we, you know, even if we use that comparative approach, we can only get so far, uh, you know, and I'm, I hope that somehow we do get more progress on that. Um, but uh, another question Corey had was, what is the bridge narrative from book two, man, to book three, war? Essentially, what can you expand upon as man relates to war? Hmm. Well, I have to think about that to try to make a a, a bridge between the two. As I said, it's gods and man really culminate in war because of the religion and the science, right? Which are the first two books. War is the application, right, of science to basically ideological conflict. And it could be, especially now, uh, before you know, countries invaded other countries to get their raw materials, their resources, uh, humans, they enslaved people and all the rest of that. Now it's gotten to the point where there's ideology that's motivating a lot of conflict, but there's also going to be a growing, probably a, um, a fight over resources again. Um, and why would country A deserve the resources more than country B? And the arguments are going to be made, well, country A is communist or it's fascist and country B is democratic or it's whatever, or this, this country is Christian, this country is Islamic, is Muslim. So there's going to be these ideas where we're going to frame our conflict in these ideological uh, frames. So we're going to use that as justification. Instead of working together, we're going to use that as justification for killing each other. And we witnessed that during the 19th, during the 20th century in, in general. The whole 20th century was going crazy with conflict because we had great new tools to use, great new weapons. We had the airplane, we had bombs, we had tanks, we suddenly had, and we had the atomic bomb eventually. So we had missiles, we had all the rest of it. It out, far outpaced our spirituality, right? It just went crazy. Christianity was still there, you know, not sure if they liked Jews or not. And then here we are with the atomic bomb we're dropping on entire populations and incinerating them. We could not keep pace with, with our understanding of science, our understanding of the spiritual I, uh, component of humanity. It's virtually non-existent. We went to church on Sunday. We went to, to temple or we whatever. But that was, that was our frame. You know, the rest of the week we were going nuts killing each other. So with war... In, in the volume of war, that's happening. And at the same time, there's the Foo Fighters. And then there's, you know, Roswell, and there's Kenneth Arnold. And there's this, this challenge to the paradigm. There's this challenge to weigh the way we understand ourselves and our conflicts with each other. There's this thing from out of left field, which is a, a challenge to everything. And our reaction was bury it right? Yeah. We can't deal with this now. Just bury it. We're busy with the Russians. We're busy with the Chinese. We're going to go to Korea. We're going to go to Vietnam. All of this is happening. You know, Indonesia is falling apart. First they had, you know, Sukarno, then they had Suharto, and then all this is happening. And there's the days of living danger, the year of living dangerously. We've got this going on. We've got that. We've got things blowing up in Latin America. I was in Chile, right? I mean, Chile was, a, was an under, under martial law. It was the weirdest place I had been probably in my life was Chile under Pinochet with the military every place, curfews and trucks and tanks. And I mean, none of it made any sense. And then suddenly the UFO shows up, right? Out of nowhere. And it like beams down and it says, hi, and then it disappears, you know? Um, war suddenly became something different. The battlefield changed. The battlefield was now moving from territory to the mind. It was moving to consciousness. Psychological warfare suddenly became a thing. As the Nazis called it, worldview warfare. That was their term for psychological warfare. 
change the world of the other person, and then you win the war. The idea was change consciousness. CIA started it. The military did it. Uh, Michael Aquino, famously of the Temple of Set, right? You dread Michael Aquino. What was he doing during Vietnam? He was in charge of the Phoenix program, which was this weird program that was a combination of things, but included um, mind control efforts, psychological warfare operations against the North Vietnamese, right? CAA was thinking, what if we broadcast a hologram of Jesus over Havana? Wouldn't the Cubans rise up and get rid of Castro if Jesus was telling them to? Yeah. So they were actually manipulating this. In the Congo, we were coming up with, let's use vampires. In Vietnam, the same. Let's, let's create this idea there's vampires everywhere. And the vampires <laughs> are yeah, it sounds funny. But the documentation is, is thick. Yeah. Isn't it? And Aquino was involved with this, right? So, and he was very open about discussing it with me. I mean, our, our idea of warfare started to move into the consciousness realm. And as we moved into the consciousness realm, we moved into psychological warfare. We were butting heads right up against the phenomenon. So people in the military, in, in I think countries around the world, said, this is great. We can use this. Every time we're trying to hide something, we'll blame it on the UFOs. Everybody thinks UFOs are nonsense anyway, so the whole thing dissipates. It goes away. Nobody pays attention. So let's use UFOs as the scapegoat for our secret weapons programs or for things that go wrong, or let's just create the UFO scenario as a way of, of just blowing smoke and confusing the hell out of everybody. This could work to our favor. So the UFO then became part of psychological warfare. Yeah. Which was really funny because the UFO was there long before psychological warfare. So you can just imagine whoever's behind the phenomenon sitting there going, yeah, uh -huh, okay, keep at it. <laughs> See yeah. what happens if you keep this up. Yeah. Right? Tic Tacs, you know, thousands of them all over your destroyers. So, you know, so war started from this point of view that the military kind of understood the connection as early as 1952. As early as 1952, they had that press conference and they knew there was a connection between psychological warfare, the UFOs, religion, and all the rest of it. They didn't go so far in the technology aspect of it. They wanted to move the conversation and shift the narrative over to angels and demons. And that's what they did in that press conference. I don't, I, I'm sure you must have seen it. Just read the whole thing. It's an eye opener because they kept moving that conversation back to, to stories like there's at least three mentions of the Bible. When did the Air Force, when did the military in a press conference ever start talking about the Bible when you asked about a military occupation or a military project of any kind or the SST or something, you know, and they start talking about, well, in the Bible, Ezekiel said, what? Yeah, and I think you said that press conference was, um, it was uh, Saunders or Sanders? So, yes, yeah, Sanders, right. Yeah, and uh, Heineck was present in the in the audience. Yeah, um, everybody was there from from Roswell. They all now had positions of authority. They were there for the crash in forty seven, right. and now they're running intel at, at at the Air Force in fifty two. Yeah, what does that connection mean? How right. That yeah, I remember Roswell was the only squadron that dropped the bomb. Right. Yeah. So they had the atomic bomb connection. And even before that, who was at Roswell but Goddard? Goddard went to Roswell to set up his secret laboratory because he got tired of dealing with the government. You know, Robert Goddard, who was one of the rocket pioneers. So he goes to Roswell long before there's a military base there and sets up his secret laboratory to which he invites no military people to come. Jack Parsons was in, in, in conversation and he was trying to find out uh, information out of Goddard as well as from Werner von Braun when Parsons was still the rocket scientist that he was. Yeah. I mean, you start putting these things together then you go insane. And, Right. Yeah. Well, and you know, I I had like so many other things to discuss with you that I, we didn't even get to. Um, you you got to let me have a whole series with you, Peter, because I I wanted to get into some sinister forces stuff, but we're we're already cutting into time over mm -hmm. here. Um, so let, we're gonna have to pick this up again sometime. But um, for the listeners, to, what is there anything coming? soon from to the stars uh whether it's this year or something that you anything you can talk about with uh that to the stars is working on i i from my perspective no i'm not working on anything 
except I'm going to be going over war once again to get that ready because I think we're coming out with that this year. I think, I think, I don't know, but I think. Um, but I know that he's working on uh, Monsters of California is supposed to be coming out somehow uh, as a film, as a feature film. I, uh, I understand it's going to be pretty fascinating film because it does touch on the phenomenon of course a great deal yeah the trailer's um, out for people who want to see that yeah, too yeah so that's something um i know there's other projects they're working on but coming out this year i think the only thing that's coming out this year is quite possibly the books three of the fiction and nonfiction, possibly oh and then on the the fiction as well too i think the fiction should be i mean i don't know if it's i don't know how deeply aj hartley is into having finished it or not or started to write it or finished writing it i don't know um everybody's being very quiet about these things because you know we've been yeah. kind of pushed back too far but uh i think that tom made some kind of sound that um at least the nonfiction should be coming out uh I, something so yeah I, and you know i think war is the most highly anticipated volume in the series no pressure yeah <laughs> so, <laughs> just saying um but yeah, I, you know, I, I, you know, thank you so much, um, Peter, for for joining me, and I, I really, it's it's great being able to talk to you and and share this discussion with the audience. And I definitely, we got to speak again. And um, do you have any parting words for the audience? Live long and prosper, baby. I can't do the thing, but you know, you guys get it. there. You go. <laughs> You're one of them. You're he's walking among us. <laughs> Again, thank you so much, Peter, and I'll, I'll speak to you soon. Okay, thanks a lot. Yeah, take care.